The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of Oshkosh Media, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Different being up here for once, you know, I've spent my whole life in this church, you know, with my parents and my grandmother, um, <laughs> so yeah, it'll be fun. <laughs> um, if you could open your Bibles this morning to uh, Matthew chapter 8, and then uh, we're going to open in prayer and see how this goes. Dear Heavenly Father, just uh, thank you for this day and just uh, thank you for uh, blessing me with this opportunity and uh, I pray that uh, uh, this message that you laid on my heart, Lord, comes through to uh, everybody else and uh, I pray that uh, everybody will have a uh, safe travels today uh, from church as we leave out here today and enjoy our fellowship after church and help us to uh, have a great rest of the day. Amen. <coughs> So, my question is, or my statement of my message, I should say, is faith versus fear. So, if we were to imagine a life without fear, you know, not in the, just the sense of fear never existed, but in the sense of fear in, I'm going to be a horrible speaker on Sunday morning, <laughs> or fear in the sense of that I'm not going to have enough money to pay my bills. Um, we have two ways in life, faith or fear. We have God's way and we have man's way. <clears throat> fear is defined in the dictionary as an unpleasant emotion caused by belief that someone or something is dangerous likely to cause pain or suffering or worse. Faith, on the other hand, is defined in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, of the evidence of things not seen. However, both of you require to have belief in something that you can't see. <clears throat> So, in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27, I'm going to read those. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But Jesus was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now, in this part in Matthew, it gets very, very descriptive. As I was reading through this, um, and, you know, Matthew's writing and he uses the word, you know, great storm or tempest in some other Bibles. But that means a very violent, strong storm, like hurricane type storm, you know, not just a whatever little bit of rain that we had out here this morning. Um, you know, the Sea of Galilee is, is known for its sudden and violent storms. So... It's evident that, you know, this, the disciples, many of whom were experienced, you know, sailors, fishermen, they spent their whole lives, you know, on the sea fishing. That's how they made their living. Um, 
you know, and then you have Jesus who just gets done, you know, preaching to a bunch of people. And he's like, I'm going to go take a nap, you know. So Jesus is just taking a nap during this hurricane storm in the bottom of the boat, and he's just hanging out. But yet this violent storm was strong enough to cause fear in these professional sailors, you know. So it wasn't like it was their first day on the ocean or their first day on the water, you know. So it, them being fearful of the storm that they thought they were going to drown, you know, shows that fear can come in at any time of our lives, whether you've done something a hundred times or you've done something your first time. <clears throat> so, uh, the disciples, you know, at this point in their ministry with Jesus have seen Christ do hundreds of miracles already, you know, um, that they, you know, have, he's healed all sorts of sickness and, uh, Saved lots of love of, of people through their faith. Um, you know, at this point in his minute, you know, just before this, you know, Jesus went through uh, all of Galilee teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God, healing every disease and affliction among the people. So you've got Jesus' disciples, you know, who have already seen him do these things. <clears throat> You know, and when they go and wake Jesus up, he asks them, well, why are you fearful? You know, they've seen him do miracles. They've seen him heal people. <clears throat> Jesus rebuked, rebuked their fear, but he wasn't punishing them for being fearful. He was questioning their fear and their unbelief in it. <clears throat> you know, he wasn't upset that they needed him, but he was disappointed in their unbelief in him. Their problem was fear, and fear and unbelief go together. When we trust God, there's little room for fear. See, fear starts to corrode our faith, and we begin to let fear take control of our lives. <clears throat> when that happens, we tend to act out in different ways. From fear to anxiety to depression, we let those things rule in our hearts and in our lives. <clears throat> But in 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. <laughs> you know, I think that's a, a very encouraging verse, you know, uh, especially, you know, in my life. Um, well, the one was speaking up here after going through to this church my whole life. But, you know, it's, you know, that's God telling us that He didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of, of love and of sound mind. You know, to be able to think clearly and find calmness through our fear to have faith in Him and trust in Him and rely on Him. <clears throat> but sometimes in our lives we have to go through infirmities. You know, you might ask what infirmities are. Infirmities can be defined as, you know, headaches, you know, pain, suffering, you know. Are moments of weakness and suffering. God uses our infirmities to work in our lives. You know, as He told 
the Apostle Paul regarding his infirmities of the flesh. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, he said, to, you know, God's talking to Paul, and he said, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am connected, content with my weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, and calamity. Calamity, whatever that word is. Yeah, that one. <laughs> For when I am weak, I am strong. <clears throat> It's funny to think about, you know. If we stop and think about it for a moment, we live in a world that is full of decay, destruction, you know, but... <laughs> and all we really need is God's grace. You know, it's, it's sufficient for us. It stains us, sustains us through our present time, you know, of what is going on in our lives. You know, as I've grown up in this church, you know, I've had lots of different mentors throughout this church which I am very grateful for. Um, <clears throat> they have taught me, you know, that God is enough for the worst of times and the best of times. <clears throat> and uh, one of the, the verses that... Uh, has really uh, stuck in through me, uh, you know, growing up around here and hearing different people speak. and um, So yeah, but that's uh, <laughs> Colossians 2, 6 through 15. And uh, it says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to elements of spirit of the world and not according to Christ. For in Him the fullness of deity dwells bodily. And having been filled in Him who is the head and the rule of authority, in Him also we are circumcised with circumcision, made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised Him from the dead. And you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with Him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. <clears throat> Here, he's showing us his different types of grace. Grace is faith-based, but He offers it to us in different ways. We have His offering to us, which was His sacrifice on the cross, which is our most wonderful form of grace, is our opportunity of salvation and the gift He's given us through that. <clears throat> you know, His conquering over all, His conquering over death, in life. And there's no strings attached to it. 
the only thing that it requires is that we accept it and we believe that He died on the cross for our sins and He rose again on the third day. Another part of it is His grace that is found in our walk, in our everyday walk, in our everyday lives. In uh, verse 6 in Colossians, he says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. You know, a lot of people go through life and say that, you know, we should all walk the walk or, you know, talk the walk or however you want to say it. But, you know, in my mind, in my heart, right there, that's God in His Word you know, telling me that I need to walk in Him. And that walk in Him is a walk of faith. We walk in it in the world among other people who are teaching falsely, who are drinking too much, who are, you know, taking the Lord's name in vain, you know. These are all things that spending enough time with it and in it or and around it, our path can change. And we let our fear lead instead of our faith. <clears throat> Now, sometimes we do have to go through times of trials and tribulations. I don't think I've ever met anybody that said they were fun and exciting, like, ooh, Jesus, pick me, I want more, you know? But <laughs> maybe Paul in his time, because, you know, he seemed to be a glutton for punishment at times, but... <laughs> In James uh, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Fastness. Fatness. My wife told me I was going to say that. So. <laughs> that was stuck in my brain. So. And let the steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. <clears throat> so, sometimes, the trials and tribulations that we go through in life, God's using it. They have a reason. You can't always see it. I don't always enjoy it. You can ask my wife. I really don't enjoy it when God decides to start shaping me again. I just got happy with where I was. <laughs> but, but that's a part of our walk and faith in God. And how He... He uses that to make us who we are today. You know, and as it says in Romans 5, 1 through 5, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. <clears throat> So even though we have those trials 
and tests in our faith, He's using those for a reason. You know, like I said earlier, those reasons we might not always be able to see. Um, some of you were here, some of you weren't here. Um, but uh, when I was in the National Guard, I deployed to Afghanistan from 2012 to 2013. Um, after returning home, I felt very disconnected from everybody, everyone. Um, I didn't really want anything to do with people. I couldn't stand people. I thought they were all annoying, you know. Um, so I kind of just lived in my own little box, my own world, you know. Um, I didn't go out and do things. I, you know, maybe friends would come over and hang out, but that was about it. You know, I didn't. I made myself feel worse by doing that, but um, it was a part of not knowing what to do with myself or you know I lived a certain way when I was in the military with my friends around me you know people who I thought were friends relationships that I've built friends that I lost everything changes and I came home and I didn't know what to do with it I didn't have anywhere to put it I didn't really want to talk to my parents about it I didn't want to talk to Pastor Paul about it. I didn't want to talk to anybody. You know? Uh, I wanted to be my own superhero, I guess you could say, in short. <clears throat> so, um, in that summer of 2013, I think it was, I decided to... I was living out of town at the time. I decided to move back home to Oshkosh with my mom and dad. And, you know, I decided to go to Northern Grace Youth Camp that summer just to counsel. <laughs> Something I've done numerous times. You know, I didn't feel, I was like, I don't know what to do with myself. I'm just going to go to camp. And so I went to camp, and I remember... I counseled all four weeks, and I was up there all summer, and we have um, alone time, which is time that you can study God's Word and, you know, prepare like your lessons for your campers and stuff. Um, but all summer during my alone time, I'd sit there and it was kind of like arguments with myself or discussions with God or whatever you want to call it, but I'd sit there and I would talk to God about how I was feeling, you know, my frustrations, my fears, everything. And I remember asking him, well, why am I here? I don't feel adequate to be in this position to teach somebody else when I can barely focus myself on you on this side. And I really didn't want to be hypocritical. I didn't want to put on a, a false, a falseness, you know, especially at, at camp. Most campers can tell when you're being fake as a counselor. You know, I'm sure Randy can attest to that, you know. They, they want the real you. <coughs> And uh, my sister was up there that summer, too. And, you know, I'd talk to her about, you know, how I was feeling. And she's like, would always tell me, well, God's got a reason for this. You know, everything that happened to you last year and everything you're feeling, God's got a reason for it. And I'm always sitting there like, yeah, okay. I'm only like, Pfft. yeah, okay, just because you're older doesn't mean you know everything. But... <laughs> but <laughs> But, like, <laughs> I find it ironic now because she was right, but, <laughs> 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 but uh, <laughs> I had a, a camper in my cabin senior high week. You know, um, 
He comes from a bigger family. You know, he was very depressed and suicidal. Um, Coming from where I was at that point in my life with the military and the experiences that I had there, you know, with coming out from it and being in a dark space mentally. Um, I think it was like Thursday night, you know, um, he got a letter in the mail that wasn't good, you know, there was some stuff going on at home. And so I ended up talking to him that night, you know, well, at first I had to find him because he ran away, but, um, you know, uh, another staff member came and sat in my cabin and helped counsel the campers. Um, but we went up to the blacktop and we talked for a very, very long time. I, I don't even know what time it was when we actually went to bed. But, you know, God used those times of trials and molding me to prepare me for that point in time for that camper, for that moment. (coughs) And, uh, you know, some people are always asking if my if I'm was happy with how like the service changed me and stuff like that, but honestly I'm okay with it because it gave me that opportunity. <clears throat> um backtrack a little bit. <laughs> when I was over there, uh, one of the, uh, a chaplain gave me, well, you know, we'd go to church and the chaplains would do services and um, I had a, a friend over there um, and uh, he had a, a necklace on with a shield on it and he gave it to me and I have it on this morning too, but um on the back of it, it's inscribed by this, is Joshua 1.9. And it says, Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? <laughs> that verse is what I showed that camper. Because it shows of what God is asking of us in those times of trials and tribulations and those dark points in our lives. He doesn't want us just to put our hands up and say, I quit, I'm done, it's not worth it anymore. No, He wants us to be challenged. He wants us to experience those things. To grow. To be able to help others. To be able to start other ministries where there's lacking of. <clears throat> you know, you can ask my wife, but I, I still talk to that camper pretty regularly. Um, we communicate with how he's doing and we talk. <clears throat> and I'm very thankful for that. You know, um, one, it helps keep me honest, you know, and, and where I am and how I'm doing with myself. But the opportunities that God gives us are never wasted. Even if we feel like it's a wasted opportunity because, oh, I don't feel efficient enough at this point in my life to be speaking up here. You know, I've told my wife that probably a hundred (laughs) times. But (sighs) 
God uses those moments to improve on us. But even when we are headed into times of trial and, and challenges, God doesn't just, you know, kick you to the curb and say, good luck, go swim, you don't need floaties, you got this. No. You know, God prepares us. He gives us He gives us tools to use. He gives us things to help us in our everyday walk. You know, um, and the, the main things that he gives us are in Ephesians uh, chapter 6. And it's uh, in verses uh, 10 through 20. You know, he gives us the armor of God. <clears throat> And it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil <clears throat> in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil and having done all to stand, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fasted on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as <clears throat> shoes of, for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly for, to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak." <clears throat> um, I wrote some notes on each piece you know they're my opinion and how I think they, they are used at times um, but uh, the belt of truth you know is used to keep us from falling away from God in the world, you know. Rightly dividing the word keeps us from falling into false teachings or false doctrines. The breastplate of righteousness is about being honest and true. You know, we, when we walk through our Christian lives, you know, we walk the walk and talk the walk, but are you going to be an example in your faith to how you act to your coworkers? You know, in, in how their everyday is. I know at my work, you know, it's not a Christian work environment. You know, how I act with my coworkers can make a difference. <clears throat> the shoes of readiness or the gospel of peace will help us be right with God and stay in Him, in God's Word, helps us to grow. It helps us as men and women in our everyday lives to mentor people that are younger than us. <clears throat> the shield of faith. This one is very, very important. It is our protector from fear and doubt, which Satan is regularly trying to attack you with. Whether it's at your job, whether it's just meeting somebody at the grocery store, you know, um, 
I like to pick on my dad sometimes, but, you know, um, my dad thinks he's not a very good speaker, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, his teeth, but, you know, um, some of you know Tim Board, some of you don't, but my, Tim Board refers to my dad as the Walmart evangelist, <laughs> um, because when my dad worked at Walmart, he started to share the gospel with people, but not, you need to be saved, hellfire and brimstone, but it was by his faith of his actions, you know, going to work every day, being on time, doing his job, not getting upset when things wouldn't go his way. And then that led to people starting to ask him questions about well, why are you this way? Why don't you get mad when you have to go pick up those apples again or reorganize the milk? You know, but God used those. God used that time in his life for the better. You know, he used it for my dad to have a ministry at Walmart. I don't know how many people got saved at Walmart while he worked there, but I know it was quite a few. <clears throat> The helmet of salvation. That's Christ's sacrifice for us on the cross. <clears throat> and for us to believe it and carry that with us every day that we don't walk through life saying, oh, I'm not saved. Or that fear that creeps into our lives. You know, we have that eternal security in Christ. <clears throat> the sword of the Spirit, which would be the Bible, it's very beneficial for us in our walks across the board. Um, whether it's sharing the gospel with the people or whether you're just discussing the Bible at work with coworkers from different backgrounds of faith. I, uh, at my work, I regularly discuss with one of my coworkers. We have great Bible discussions at work throughout the day. You know, we don't necessarily believe the same, but we can openly discuss God's Word without fear or shame of it because it's something that we're both proud in and believe in. And uh, the last one would be the power of prayer. To pray for others, to be in Christ, but that we may also be strong to proclaim Christ. You know, at any point in our lives, we have opportunities to share Christ with others. Um, whether it's at a grocery store, whether you're just checking out groceries or getting something from the meat counter, you know, I mean, it's an opportunity, you know, when I used to work at Pick and Save before I got in trouble for it, you know, I used to say, oh, God bless you, I'm praying for you, at, you know, after I'd give people stuff at the meat counter, you know, but sometimes that's all somebody needs to hear, is that somebody else cares about them that they don't need to live in their fear and anxiety anymore because somebody cares. We all a lot of times like to walk around our straight and narrow paths with our blinders on. I'm going to those set of chairs and nothing else is going to stop me. But that we forget about our fellow brothers and sisters that are along the way. You know, Christ never meant for us to walk alone. You can, but it wasn't meant to be that way. You know, if you look at Paul's epistles throughout his epistles, you have people coming alongside Paul or Paul coming alongside others to help carry him through on his walk of faith.
I'm very thankful that Paul just decided not to have a, a, a feared full life. I mean, if you ask Paul, I think it'd be pretty cool to have a conversation and sit down with Paul because, I mean, how many times was he basically beaten to death or whipped or thrown in prison or whatever it was? You know, his faith is what kept his fear away. He could have had the fear of being stoned to death. More than once it happened. But his, our faith is what pushes us through every day. Our faith is what we rely on. Our faith is what we believe in. It's where we start our foundation for everything. Whether it's for our families, our friends, whatever it is. We have to start a life filled with faith and not with fear. Because with fear, we have nothing. But in faith, we have everything. I'm just going to close in prayer now. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, just uh, thank you for uh, letting me have this opportunity today, Lord. Um, I pray that uh, you will give us safe traveling mercies as we go out from here today, but that we can remember to live a life of, of faith in you, Lord, and to give our everyday lives over to you, and that we can just stay encouraged in, in you, and just uh, help us have a good rest of the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this episode of Grace Bible Church's Sunday Morning Worship Service. If you'd like to contact us, please write to us at P.O. Box 3025, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, 54903. Or you can visit us on the World Wide Web at www.gbcoshkosh.org.